Welcome everybody back from lunch. Good to see you again. My name is uh, Eleanor Meet. I am a fellow at the Safra Center and I'm going to introduce you to the lighting round. Um, as Larry mentioned in the beginning of our conference today, tremendous work uh, was done in the lab during these last five years. And we wanted to give you the opportunity to hear from as many people as possible about their projects uh, in the lab, whether they are researchers, uh, journalists, um, from various fields of uh, interest. Um, we got um, many, many applications for this round, and I must tell you it was very hard to select uh, which projects to include in the session because uh, I thought almost all the applications were fascinating, interesting, and we thought that they will interest you, but uh, because we wanted to give each person at least five minutes to present their uh, work, we had to um, reduce the number of uh, uh, presentations uh, from the number of people who applied. We're going to have now, uh, until the break, eight people presenting. Uh, I, think, I think I'm not going to present you now together because you'll just present each person um, yourself. People will forget your names by the time you get here. Um, and after the break, we will have uh, eight more people. I want also to thank Mirko. Where is Mirko? Mirko, thank you so much. We um, selected the... the um, um, presenters together and it was uh, thanks to you that uh, it was done. So, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, medical talks always start with disclosures. So, um, I wish to disclose that I'm the founder and president of Clear Review, which is the subject of this presentation. So, a young man goes into the ER complaining of hip pain. An x-ray is red as normal, and he's sent home. A week later, when the leg is still hurting, he gets an MRI that shows an obvious deformity of the hip, obvious even without the arrow, that was barely perceptible on the original x-ray. In, origi in the inevitable lawsuit that follows, plaintiff's expert claims the defendant radiologist was negligent for not having seen the abnormality. The defense expert says that the abnormality was so subtle he would not have seen it. It was only seen because of subsequent imaging showing progression of the abnormality. So how's our legal system supposed to deal with these competing claims? Many malpractice lawsuits uh, revolve around expert testimony with dueling experts competing to be the most credible before the jury. Both plaintiffs and defense lawyers acknowledge the potential for expert witness bias, but insist that their expert is able to put that bias aside. It's the other guy's expert who's irredeemably tainted. Biases can take many forms. Retrospective bias was invoked in the opening story. We sometimes call this the Monday morning quarterback or the I knew it all along phenomenon. Framing bias refers to the way in which a situation is presented. We all know about Tom Sawyer. He conned his friends into paying him to do his chore of whitewashing the fence by telling him how much fun it was. Well, radiologists experience this framing bias whenever a lawyer hands us a disc containing images. No radiologist has ever been handed a CD of normal exams by a lawyer. <laughs> Whatever is on that disc, the story doesn't end well. Other biases are bound up in our adversarial legal system. Compensation bias refers to the fact that an expert is pretty much guaranteed to agree with the point of view of the side that's paying him. Clear Review is a company I started three years ago to eliminate this bias when it comes to radiology litigation. Our premise is that if the expert doesn't know which exam is the subject of litigation, then the opinion he renders will be objective. Further, if he doesn't know who's retained him, he won't be swayed by compensation bias, even unconsciously. So to do this, we gathered over 1,000 radiology exams with their reports and removed all identifying information. When a new case is referred to us, we remove its identifying information and insert it into the database. We create a review set of about 10 exams that recreates the environment in which the original exam was read. The expert is told that one or more of the exams in the set is a subject of litigation. He's instructed to review all the exams and present his findings of each. We then take the comments made on the litigation case and send them back to the client attorney. 
This is an improvement over the usual police lineup because in the, the witness, in, the, in the lineup, the witness simply needs to pick out the bad guy and ignore the rest of the subjects. In our review sets, there's usually at least one exam from a previous legal case, and the experts have been told so. So he can't just find the outlier and dismiss the other exams. In two years of operation, we've conducted 45 reviews of 24 legal cases. In some of the reviews, the expert was able to identify the litigation case as being below the standard of care. In some of the reviews, the expert passed the exam of interest. We've had three radiologists deposed without objection to our methods by opposing counsel, but it hasn't yet been challenged in court. This may occur in June when the first case involving clear review is scheduled for trial. The process has been favorably received by lawyers who've retained our services, as well as the radiologists who've served as expert witnesses. They find the experiences realistic and are very comfortable with the opinions they render. We've also used the ClearReview platform for research purposes. In a recently concluded study, we documented statistically significant differences in the responses of radiologists to the same exams, depending on whether they were told they were reviewing for plaintiff or defense attorneys. To be honest, the blind review concept has found a more receptive audience in defense rather than plaintiff's counsel. But it's our opinion that once juries make it clear that they place a higher level of trust in the testimony of a blinded expert, then plaintiffs will need to use blinding techniques as well. Once that occurs, expert bias will be markedly reduced and radiology lawsuits can hopefully be settled more quickly, economically, and most importantly, fairly. So thank you for your attention and to the Safra Center for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. And that's it. Hi, I'm Lisa Cosgrove, and Bob Whitaker will be talking in more detail about our book, a book that came out of um, the lab, Psychiatry Under the Influence. Um, but what I wanted to say as a preface is, despite its provocative title, Psychiatry Under the Influence, it's not an anti-psychiatry book or an anti-medication book. And in fact, what I hope it does, what I we think it does, is that it does something that's very congruent with the goals and mission of the lab, and that is to engender conversations among people who might hold very disparate views um, and might feel very strongly on both sides of the issue. So, Yeah, we uh, really had two aims with this book, this project. One was uh, to indeed investigate institutional psychiatry. Uh, through this lens that has been developed at the lab. And the other really was to show a sort of a case study of how this, this lens uh, does really illuminate a problem. It shows the influences at work, it shows some of the barriers to reform, and, and then what are some of the solutions. So it really has these two objects. And one is just to show that this framework that was developed at the lab helps you see and understand corruption in a new way. At least that was our experience. So institutional, uh, who is institutional academic, what is the institution that we're looking at? We're looking at the American Psychiatric Association and Academic Psychiatry, we said this is basically the institution of psychiatry in the United States. And then we looked since 1980, their behavior in the environment since, since 1980, and the reason since 1980, that was when the American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and this is when they sort of jettison old Freudian uh, psychological ideas for uh, psychiatric distress and embrace a disease model. And it's since this time that psychiatry has gained such an outsized influence on our society. So <clears throat> applying this framework, what did we do? We first identify the economies of influence that are at work here. One economy of influence, of course, is pharma money that goes to the American Psychiatric Association, also pharma money that goes to academic psychiatrists. We chart that. The second economy of influence that I think is sort of novel or that we give a lot of attention to is the institution's own guild influences. So in 1980, when this happens, it really has three products in the medical marketplace. It has diagnoses, it has research, and it has drugs. It sort of seeds talk therapy to psychologists and others. And now you can see the potential uh, tension that arises because of this guild influence. Psychiatry has a need. It's, it's, a, it's presented this new model, this new disease model to the population. And now it has a need to say that research is uncovering the biology of disorders, that its uh, disorders are valid, and that the drugs are very safe and effective. 
which is all very fine if indeed the science is supporting that story that the Guild wants to tell. And what we do in this book is basically look at the story that psychiatry has told on those four issues and then look at the science and see if they're consonant or not. And what you find very quickly is there is a big gap between what science is telling us about psychiatric disorders, the validity, the safety and efficacy of drugs, and what is being told to the population. Having, having documented that corruption, then we look at the social injury. And the social injury, I think, is actually profound. And it really goes around the idea of informed consent. Informed consent, of course, is to the individual patient. If you have a story that is not consistent with science, you're violating that informed consent with the patient. But I think there's an informed consent uh, agreement really with society at, at large. You have a medical profession that has a duty to be honest in its presentation to that society. And if it's not honest, it's sort of violating that informed consent principle because now society organizes itself around a story that in fact is not well grounded in science. I'll give you one quick example of this sort of disparity. We've all heard, I got one minute left, we've all heard about these, uh, you know, how these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain. That's a story that the etiology of mental disorders has been discovered, the drugs fix it like in, uh, insulin for diabetes. If you look at the science, that, did, that hypothesis did not pan out. So that's an example of the difference between the science and, and what we actually uh, are told. Having done that, we look at, uh, you know, why doesn't psychiatry undersee this? Brings you into cognitive dissonance, and all I can say is doctors have a particular uh, vulnerability to cognitive dissonance, in my opinion, because of their self-image. And then finally, we look at the prescriptions for reform, and this goes to how this, I, this framework really helps, because of course you have to neutralize these economies of influence, so you have to neutralize the pharma influence, a lot of thought on that. There's a lot less attention to neutralizing guild influences, and I will tell you, we struggle to find out prescriptions for how you do that, so thank you. Okay. Well, it's a great privilege to have the chance to spend five minutes sharing with you a successful, working, large institute of institutional integrity that eliminates several practices by pharmaceutical companies that systematically corrupt research clinical trials, medical knowledge, and ultimately clinical practice. Much of the excellent work done by Safra Fellows in this area concerns conflicts of interest and um, covert forms of bias in research and testing that ultimately harm patients. Companies furiously compete to develop new patentable products that can be sold for 50 to 100 times manufacturing costs. Funding research from those sales leads companies to develop mostly minor variations for more patented products. Only about 2% of all new drugs over a decade, and actually this is true for three decades, um, are regarded by independent review groups as break clinical breakthroughs and another 10% as clinically significant advances. But the other 90% uh, offer few or no advantages over existing drugs, even though they are approved. But serious risks, risks of harm are quite high. About a one in five chance with new drugs that there will be serious adverse reactions in the first decade. One in three chance if reviews are expedited. Prescription drugs are the fourth leading cause of death tied with stroke. Now, in my first month at Safra, uh, Malcolm Salter told me with his infectious enthusiasm that the material about how the Maru Negri Institute staves off corrupting forces and has developed systemic forms of institutional integrity was the most exciting part of what I had presented. And he and Dan Wickler encouraged me to start developing, sort of changing direction while I was there. The result is um, a forthcoming book called Good Pharma, in contrast to Ben Goldacre's book, Bad Pharma, uh, a public health model of the Maru Negri Institute, co-authored um, with Antonio Maturo uh, from the University of Bologna. The book, the book features work of the Safra Center, and it comes out in July. Um, 
the flyers that are going to be around offer a 30% discount if you hang on to them <laughs> until July. So it's right down in there, and so just hang on to them and you'll get a 30% discount. Can't work now. So the Mario Negri Institute is a fiercely independent, multi-campus, non-profit institute in Milano and Bergamo, founded with the belief that pharmaceutical research has a mission to improve the health of patients and societies. Teams in its 51 laboratories have developed both institutional rules and organizational practices that minimize distorting influences even when pharmaceutical companies fund part of the research or clinical trials. Uh, these include, first, keeping control of the research design from the beginning to the end and its execution done by in-house salaried uh, research staff. Second, a focus on serious unmet needs. Third, funding from competitive grants and contracts from governments, charities, foundations, and companies with no source accounting for more than 10% of all research funds to prevent dependence, corruption, and to be independent to speak out against misleading trials and ineffective or harmful drugs, as they repeatedly do. Fourth, no patenting of discoveries, because seeking patents and profits distorts research at every step, beginning with what um, you have to do. Fifth, open collaborative research, uh, six, the Mario Negri clinical trials are a public health good and an integral part of a universal health system. Seventh, long, large, competitive, comparative effectiveness trials with unpaid volunteers. And finally, um, articles written by researchers themselves that include all negative as well as positive uh, outcomes. Trials by the Institute are amongst the most trusted in Europe and appear in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, the Lancet, and the BMJ. The, the Maru Negri Institute can serve as a model for research labs and for whole universities that want to restore institutional integrity to pharmaceutical research, clinical trials, and publications. The book uh, has other models of institutional integrity and, the, and also describes how the Institute researchers do much more, political advocacy for evidence-based prescribing. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mark Rodwin, and I want to speak to you about uh, my project has to do with institutional corruption and pharmaceutical policy. And starting with Larry Lessig's definition, uh, systemic influences, which may be legal or ethical, can undermine the institution's effectiveness, diverting purpose or weakening its ability to achieve its purpose. Now, I want to also emphasize one other idea of uh, uh, Lessig, and that is the idea of improper dependencies. And I'm basically mapping out six areas where I find in the pharmaceutical policy improper dependencies on the pharmaceutical industry and suggesting through a series of papers and I hope eventually a book that uh, how these can be uh, addressed. So because there's too much to do, I want to just focus on one, on off-label prescribing and then just list the other categories I've been uh, looking at afterwards so you at least see the research program. So on the idea of off-label prescribing, basically the FDA approved drugs uh, upon evidence of showing that they're safe and effective for uh, a particular use. And that feeds into the label, and the FDA only regulates what can be marketed so we've got a gap where physicians can prescribe for any purpose. But basically what off, is off-label is using a drug for uh, a therapeutic purpose that's different or to treat different uh, patients that it wasn't tested on, different age cohort, or for different dosages or different durations and a number of other things. There's a number of ways something can be off-label. And it's not a great category because many areas uh, of off-label use might be appropriate. Or, uh, and so 
I, I acknowledge that. But look at the problem we have. Um, Radley suggests that about 21% of prescriptions are off-label, and when you get to special populations or a particular area of practice, it can be up to 80 or 90%. So you have the FDA regulating drug use, but uh, it's not working. And secondly, the problem is that about 70% of off-label uses lack significant uh, scientific support. So that's a major problem. And uh, what I argue is that it in, undermines both the uh, ideal of evidence-based medicine, the practice of medicine, uh, the role of the FDA as a regulator, uh, and, and there are a number of um, reasons uh, for this. And basically, we've got a problem now because our institutions don't allow us to even track or identify the extent of the problem or uh, find ways to address it and manage it. So why do we have so much inappropriate uh, off-label use? And there are many factors, but I'm focusing on what I think is the main one, which is pharmaceutical industry marketing illegally and sometimes legally. Um, and their own incentives. Uh, and basically, we are relying on pharmaceutical firms to produce evidence of safety and effectiveness, and we rely on them to market appropriately. And there's a mismatch between their own incentives in the short term and the public interest of society. So the usual recommendations to deal with this is that we maybe need to enforce uh, uh, sanctions for illegal marketing uh, or um, use criminal fines or require disclosure of physician pharma financial ties or have education. But all of these um, solutions I suggest don't have a problem. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we need to do three things. We need to track off-label prescriptions. We need to finance evaluation to see when they're appropriate or not. And we need to end pharmaceutical incentives to market off-label. And I suggest that if we can get on each prescription some information about the core diagnosis, uh, and um, uh, we can then quickly track off-label use. That allows studying the problem for the first time in a systematic way, finding out when it's due to pharmaceutical firm influence and not. And um, uh, secondly, I would say that pharmaceutical firms which profit from sales, even off-label sales, have an obligation to uh, study these off-label uses, and so we need to uh, require them to fund such studies when they spend more than uh, uh, uh. that's the quick agenda I'll respect the time so that I'm not off label and off time uh. Hi, my name is Anne Christine Posten, and what I would like to try to convince you of today is first of the obvious that institutional corruption leads us to distrust, and not as obvious to distrust not just any institution which acts in a corrupt way, but rather completely unrelated others. And as a consequence of this, that this distrust leads us to process informi information differently which results in quite some surprising outcomes. Let me dive directly into the first study which I ran, where I just asked participants to either recall instances where they themselves had been part of a corrupt system and thus have experienced institutional corruption, or in a control condition, where I just asked the participants to recall an instance where they had an encounter with another person the day before. So what we would now expect is that participants who had recalled an instance of corruption should be more distrustful. To measure this, I used completely unrelated persons, so they received pictures of many different individuals, and we merely asked the participants to rate the trustworthiness of all of those people. And what happened, and what is not as surprising, is that, in fact, Participants rated those unrelated people to be more trustworthy in the neutral compared to the condition where they had in a recalled an instance of institutional corruption. So, what does this actually mean? Well, trust has been 
as old as mankind itself and arguably even older. It seems to be very basic ways for us to process our, our information when we're trusting or when we're distrusting. And when we have a closer look at circumstances when we trust, it's typically when we're among our kin, our friends, our family, our close others, basically when we're among similar others. Whereas when we're distrusting, we're rather dealing with outgroups, we're dealing with others, we're dealing with different ones. So what makes this with our cognition is pretty interesting that whenever we are among similars, we're starting to search for similarities and we're starting to actively look for them and start to see things to be more similar to one another. Whereas when we're among different other ones and we're starting to look for differences, we start to see the world to be more different or instances to be more different. This is what I tested in a second study where first participants were repeatedly exposed to the concept of either to trust or to distrust. And afterwards, they received um, pairs of objects and we merely asked them how similar or different they perceived them to be. For instance, we asked how similar or different are several pairs of objects, for instance, red wine and white wine. And surprisingly, what happened was that if participants were repeatedly exposed to the concept of trust, they were now rating those instances to be more similar to one another compared to a distrust condition. What's quite interesting about this is that this directly relates to memory, and probably I don't need to convince you that memory is quite important, and you don't need to make the confusion yourself that if it has been your or somebody else's helicopter struck by ground fire to find out that outcomes of a bad memory are pretty bad for you. And what all of research basically for memory shows is that the more similar contents are, the more likely we are to confuse them. So if uh, trust leads us, to, uh, oops, that's the other way. <laughs> if trust leads us to perceive things to be more similar, distrust to perceive things to be more different, then actually trust should lead to blurrier memories than distrust. And in a final study, this is exactly what I tested. I used a, a memory paradigm where people had to remember word lists and they had actually saw all of the outer word lists, for instance, I, injection and sharp, which all relate to the inner circled word needle. But what was a bit tricky about the task is that they've seen everything but the inner word. And if afterwards people are asked whether they had seen the word needle, they are very likely to recall that they did. And so again, what we did in this study was to ask participants to this time recall instances of trust or distrust and then engage in those memory tasks where they are very likely to make false memories and recall laws that they have never seen before. And what we found was that participants who were more trustful were more likely to inaccurately remember those words that had never been shown to them. So memory is actually better when participants, when people seem to be distrustful. In one sentence, it seems to be that institutional corruption leads us to distrust, which leads to our, our, which alters our perception and leads to a different ways of remembering the world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research. My name is Yelena Denisova Schmidt. I'm originally from Russia, but now I work in Switzerland. Um, corruption, uh, Russia is on its way to become an academic superpower, and Russia is doing very well, at least in the BRIC context. Um, the only problem that Russia still uh, has to face with is corruption. Corruption in higher education can take different forms. In my research, I focus only on corruption with the student involvement. And I look at corruption um, at these issues in the following situation, by taking exams, by writing papers, and by communicating with the faculty. My research shows that all of these cheating techniques are present in the Russian university, and some of them even increase during university studies. For example, the usage of creep sheets or copying off. 
Uh, Russian students, some of them, do not even need to prepare crib sheets by themselves. They can purchase almost uh, crib sheets for almost every subject. The only thing that they have to do is to prepare crib sheets in a proper way and to use them secretly during tests or exams. Um, the, uh, the ghost writing of academic paper also increases during university studies. Uh, advertisement for such services can be found almost at every campus. I made these pictures at one university I visited during my research. This is uh, the uh, way to the main building, and this is one announcement made on this road. By calling this number, I can order uh, ready written papers, ready academic papers. Yeah. Why is the situation so dramatic at Russian universities? My explanation for it, improper dependencies between all the involved actors made it possible. Young people without, without high education have almost no chances on the job market. Uh, the system of vocational education is almost destroyed. Sometimes people do not, any, uh, do not any, have any opportunities to be educated further. That's why they go to university. Uh, almost 80% of young Russians go to university and almost of them finish the university. The faculty is under pressure from the uh, administration not to expel students for underachievement. How can they do it? They can vote down their requirements, uh, they can ignore cheating, they can accept plagiarism, or they can expect or even demand something in return, for example, gifts, services, or payment for better treatment, or for, for preferential treatment, or for better marks. The administration uh, of the university is also under pressure from the Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, the budget of a public university is calculated according with the number of students they have. If university will expel their students, they need to return money they receive from the state, they need to return them back. And sometimes it's hardly possible because this money isn't used for covering personal costs, for covering other costs. The situation at private university is even worse, uh, with probably some exceptions, because private universities are totally dependent on students' fees. I believe it's very important to study corruption at higher education. Young people, they are expected to make uh, the change, they are expected to make the system, but uh, it's not the case, unfortunately it's not the case in Russia. In my studies, I observe that uh, students are getting more tolerant towards corruption during university studies. And the consequences for Russia, uh, for further development, might be very dramatic. And it will be not, it might be not only the Russian problem, because academic corruption, university corruption can be exported. There are a lot of Russian students uh, in, um, at Euro European universities. There are some students at American universities. And this university also have to deal with these problems. Many thanks for your attention. Justin Schlossberg, Birkbeck University of London and Network Fellow for this year. Uh, my project for the lab is part of a broader uh, research program looking at investigative journalism in Western democracies. And I'm interested in investigative journalism mainly because, as we know, it can be such an effective remedy for institutional corruption. And we've seen examples of that by some of the work of investigative fellows at the lab. Uh, but also because journalists are, of course, themselves also vulnerable to institutional corruption, which can profoundly weaken the potency of that remedy. So what does institutional corruption in journalism look like? Uh, following the conceptual framework developed by Larry and others, I'm not thinking of it in terms of systemic criminal corruption like that exposed in the phone hacking scandal, for instance, or more generally in the kind of practices that breach formal codes of ethical conduct in journalism. I'm thinking instead of the pressures, less visible, more subtle, that cumulatively can at times tip the balance of coverage in favour of elite interests in certain stories, particularly national security journalism, which is my area of interest, and that's, that's undermined the dem democratic promise of journalism. Uh, more specifically, my work draws on the um, model of primary definition developed by Stuart, uh, Stuart Hall, among others, which speculates that a combination of institutional pressures and the professional ideology of journalism 
can result in what Hall said was the likelihood that those in powerful or high status positions who offer opinions about controversial topics will have their definitions accepted. It also draws on the work of power by Stephen Lukes, and in particular his concept of the third dimension of power, which I think has particular resonance for institutional corruption. And this model has been used to describe the kind of ideological force that can result from what is left out of the news agenda. So um, how do we apply this to empirical research? One example is a study by Bennett and others in 2006, which looked at press coverage of the Abu Ghraib scandal. And what they found was that although journalists had relatively easy access to evidence of a top-down policy of torture, um, the, this frame was marginalised in the coverage in favour of an official definition that limited the story to the actions of a few individual low-ranking soldiers. Now, importantly, journalists didn't just repeat the official script verbatim. They applied a, what we might call a secondary definition that opened up a modicum of debate around issues about whether the um, how serious the mistreatment was, how proportional the punishments were, etc. So my case study looks at coverage of the Snowden revelations in 2013, and using this approach and what we know of official resp responses to the story, I hypothesized two elements to the primary definition, if you like. First, that surveillance programs are necessary and proportionate to the terrorist threat, and second, that Snowden leaks undermined national security. And my research found, predictably, that much of the coverage in the mainstream press was based around secondary definitions of those issues. So that opened up debate, for instance, around the balance between national security and privacy rights and civil liberties. Uh, but what was omitted is alternative frames that directly contradicted that pri primary definition. And by omitted, I mean marginalised rather than excluded. But one example, for instance, is the notion that surveillance programmes are not only used in the fight against terror, but also for things like industrial espionage, um, political expediency, etc., for which significant evidence emerged in the leaks. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go into detail uh, here about my methodology and results, but please do email me or grab me if you have any queries. I will just say uh, in closing that um, my research doesn't, of course, assume that the mainstream media agenda is limited to, or that the, the media agenda as a whole is limited to that of the mainstream press. But it does demonstrate, I think, um, a profound, uh, it demonstrates, I think, that the, the, the press, the mainstream press, still have a profound influence on the shaping of policy and public debate, certainly in, in national security contexts. And that's a problem, I think, that my research is ultimately directed towards. Thank you very much, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Hi, I'm Lawrence Tai. I was a residential lab fellow here last year. I'm very thankful to Larry and the lab for providing uh, the time and space to think about regulatory capture. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to try to present in less than five minutes two counterintuitive points about capture. Um, and the first is this idea that capture is against the public interest. So um, it was already talked about this morning, so it actually gives me more time to like get to, to the meat of it. Uh, but just to show where it's been, it was in the Supreme Court, in a Supreme Court dissent for the first time earlier this year. It was the main subject of congressional hearing last year. Um, it's been in the press a number of times in the last year. Um, the book was shown earlier today. Um, and various agencies have all been called captured by works of scholarship. And so in terms of understanding capture and how to respond to it, it's generally understood that capture is a bad thing. No one has, very few people talk about capture and, and, um, and says that it's a good thing. And so the first point is to show why the defining regulatory capture as against the public interest provide, produces some incoherence. Um, and the main reason for this is that whatever you think the public interest is, there are two dimensions to it. Uh, the first dimension, I would say, comes in various terms. Um, I've put four terms up there, the public's position, the values, ideology, ideal point. These are all kind of technical terms that reflect um, conflicts in values that we might have as a society. Um, but then there's information that goes into regulation, which almost everyone believes is a valuable thing, because whatever regulation uh, regulators come up with, it ought to 
reflect more of the facts on the ground. Um, and a lot of this information comes from industry. And so while there is a clear benchmark for the public interest if we're only operating along the dimension of values, there is not an obvious benchmark for the public interest once we throw the dimension of information in. Um, and so I've chosen to define capture only in terms of the shift in a regulator's position toward industry, right? And this reflects the disproportionate influence um, and the skewing of policy the regulatory capture is supposed to cause. Um, and so why is this important? Is this just a conceptual point? Um, I say that it's not. And the reason is that most of the solutions that people have come up with to address capture try to reduce the amount of influence that industry has over the regulatory process. Right? Because capture is caused by disproportionate influence and it causes policy to be more favorable to industry than it would be otherwise, right? the logic is that we should reduce this influence. But with information being provided in many of the same activities that cause capture, right, we, can, we can come up with this alternative understanding of capture in which the ability to skew policy toward your favor actually provides an incentive to produce information for regulation. And that if you didn't have the ability to capture an agency, you wouldn't produce as much information. Um, so where does that leave us? So instead of various solutions to try to prevent capture and to reduce influence, you move the starting point. And so this is what I call correcting for capture. You allow for a shift in the regulator's position, but um, once the capture occurs with information, right, the first amount of capture actually takes a regulator closer to where the public was, right? So if we imagine that industry is over here and the public is over here and the regulator is way out over here, right? The first amount of capture will actually bring regulation closer to where the public is. Um, and you know, so this, this is better than having an agency start out exactly where the public is and making it immovable because of the incentives for information. Um, and so what this means concretely is you want to find ways to start agencies further apart from industry. And so two methods um, that exist out there but haven't been thought of as solutions for capture is focusing on executive appointments. So for example, Gary Gensler's tenure at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission would be an example. Um, and then so-called hammer provisions, which specify default policies in the event the agency fails to regulate. That's another way to do it. Um, this is not easy to implement. Um, I don't make that claim. Um, but I claim that it's possible. Um, there is a lot more lying underneath this, including a form model, which I didn't have time to explain. Um, but I hope I've at least made the two basic points that what people have thought about capture um, is at least subject to challenge. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have the instruction to call everyone to the f to in front of the table to line up to take questions from the audience at those two microphones. Uh, Professor Light, I'd be interested in how the uh, Negri Institute uh, uh, persuades pharmaceutical companies to fund research that the Institute conducts in such a uh, uh, highly in, uh, integrity-oriented fashion. Well, I guess the starting point is the, um, the reputation and quality of the research that they do and their ability to solve problems. So companies come and say, we have this problem, this puzzle, and we'd like help from you. And so they say, well, tell us your problem. And then they go back and huddle in their research committee and work out a design and come back and say, here's how we would do it. If you find that persuasive and worthwhile, then we'll go into contract. And if not, you can go somewhere else. Hi everyone, I'm Marc-André Gagnon from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, Dr. Rodwin, um, how do we end the or reduce off-label use of drugs? Basically the last point you didn't have time to make. We need to change the incentive and the reimbursement. And now you're paid for any use. So the, my basic point is we can uh, say off-label sales should be compensated at the marginal cost of production rather than any profit. and it, Obviously, that's not easy to do, but I do have a, uh, a way to do it. You have to do some cost accounting from the firms. Uh, we have cost accounting, uh, a model in the Medicare program for reimbursing hospitals. 
Uh, so my name is Jay Young Dahl. I'm with the Initiative for Responsible Investment uh, here at Harvard. Uh, so Dr. Robinson, uh, so how do you how do you control for the guild effect in your work? That is, uh, many doctors who are called to be expert witnesses don't want to opine in a way that would make it more difficult for them when they're practicing. And so you see doctors who approve of certain practices because they don't want to be called on that themselves. And I think that is kind of a guilt kind of issue that was talked about in one of the other presentations. Well, in in the litigation that, I, that we have involvement with, there's expert witnesses for the plaintiff and expert witnesses for the defense. So um, that, in theory, the system con controls for the guild effect that way. Um, I don't, it's hard to. Uh, but you're saying there's kind of neutrality in your system that does away with that kind of guild bias. Well, if, if in, in the setting where the expert that's reviewing the exam doesn't know whether he is being retained by a defense counsel or by a plaintiff's counsel, that reduces the association bias that would lead him to either um, uh, be more uh, strict in his interpretation of what the standard of care is or more lenient. Does that address your question at all? Uh, I, don't think it's, it, yeah, I don't think it responds to the kind of frame question. That is, um, when a person is in a profession they get a comfortableness, whether it's in academia or whatever, and they don't want that comfortableness to be uh, upset in any way. And so when they're called to opine for others outside their profession, they often will then do things to protect their profession overall. And in the medical profession, it's to say, well, if we made a mistake, it, it's, it's an art. You know, medicine is, is not a science, it's an art, and and because you don't want to be called on that type of thing. That's, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Donald, welcome back. Thank you. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. As you probably know, the Saab, uh, the, Saab, the Safra, uh lab uh, does not shut down until tomorrow night. So I've got a question for you. Uh, I was really surprised and shocked by items three and four on your otherwise very sensible list of what makes for a good drug. Uh, num I'll leave number three for you and I to talk to offline, but number four about patents was really quite interesting uh, because uh, we're not sitting too far away you know, from the Office of Technology Transfer of Harvard University, uh, which basically is very much in the patent business uh, in medicine as in other kinds of scientific uh, discovery here. And what's interesting to me, I, I want to get a little bit more of your thoughts about what, make, how that works, you know, uh, beyond the institute that you studied, when in fact patents for drugs have not only started at the pharmaceutical level, but also at the molecule level, you know, where they're beginning patented, and then of course uh, venture capital people and private equity people are buying up portfolios, you know, of these of these molecules, investing in them just the way movie moogles, you know, invest in multiple films, you know, at the same time to balance their risk and also be able to put more money into selected uh, properties. So this strikes me as a very revolutionary idea. I'd like to see what kind of thinking, you know, you've got on that. And well, just a couple of comments. Since the Bayh-Dole Act in 1980, if you compare the 35 years before that with the 35 years after that, the the tremendous proliferation of patents has, to my knowledge, I'd be interested if anyone has evidence to the contrary, because everyone who's pro-patent says that patents, that, that pharmaceuticals are the, are the kind of uh, perfect case of how great patents are. I can find no evidence that there are, are clinically more superior new drugs after Bayh-Dole than before Bayh-Dole. And second, in, in, in Europe for, for decades, including during part of the golden era of uh, pharmaceutical research, pharmaceuticals medicines were exempted from patents altogether in many countries uh, for many decades um, because they were regarded as a social good, which is the Maro Negri position. And when Italy finally dropped the exemption, they said, we will not participate in this and have never patented anything. And the book has a picture of an Amgen letter from the head of, of, of uh, legal services um, 
acknowledging the transfer of intellectual property rights for a $3,400 per pill drug with a $1 bill attached to the letter. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and besides my not really, you know, seriously wondering if what evidence there is that patenting has improved higher clinical quality medicines, um, there's a lot of um, debate in, in law and in, in economics about the various ways in which patents are ob uh, obstacles to innovation. Can I respond to that? Yeah. Just to say that there's now a big l literature on um, the problem. So patents is obviously one way to get funding for, incent uh, for development and research. There's a fair amount of literature, Baker in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. and others are suggesting that what we're paying is way too much and we could finance it less. And what we're basically paying is to fund clinical trials to test drugs, which is about half the cost of getting a drug to market. Uh, and he suggests publicly funding of clinical trials. Even if you don't adopt that, there's a, clearly two problems with patents recognized. One is it doesn't provide incentives if you don't have a market. Um, so developing countries, tropical diseases, you can have the patent, but you don't have the market. And so Gates Foundation and a whole bunch of other groups are trying to figure out ways to finance development for certain things. And the other problem that Don's discussed about is you have a lot of investment for things that don't have a heck of a lot of social utility, but capture part of the existing market. So it's a very interesting intellectual problem that's not solved yet on how to supplement patents or get alternative to patents or change the duration of patents or do other things because it's a very, 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 very crude incentive uh, for pharmaceutical research. One thing just to think about is that Mario Negri in any one year is running 70 clinical trials with about 80,000 subjects. All those trials are fully funded through contracts and grants. There is no debt. There is no money needed to be recovered by pricing medicines high. To be continued with the real value of, 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 of government funding from NIH over the last decade down by 20%, I'm worried about the funding of the labs at MGH, at the Dana-Farber, uh, around the chemical departments around the university. Uh, so let's continue this, Donald. This is a good talk. My name is James Corbett. I'm an SVP of a health system and uh, a network fellow as well. I have uh, two questions. The first one's from Mark. Moving from five IRBs to one as part of our health system, and as you can imagine, all the fun that comes with that. Uh, this is a broader conversation, but two or three tips on things to think about in terms of closing that door for non-FDA approved materials and light consent. The second question is for Anne. I was fascinated by the notion of trust and distrust, particularly as it relates to that notions of longer memories with distrust. So thoughts for executives on change management and how to leverage that notion of trust to get employees to move in the right direction. I'm not sure what you were asking me about uh, IRBs. Uh, so, uh, or... The question is that you, know, you start to see a lot of FDA, non-FDA approved devices and others right. slipping through through weak IRBs. So as you move to one IRB and centralize it, what are some of your thoughts around how to strengthen some of the protections against non-FDA items slipping into hospital use? Well, I, I'm still not sure I fully understand, but I mean, there's, there's one issue of whether you get on the market and then the off-label issue is once you're on the market, how can you use it? And I'm not trying to prohibit all innovation or saying the FDA will limit use, but I say that you need, need to not give the incentive to encourage off-label use. Uh, and secondly, if you do have it, we want to evaluate it, and so she will require companies to fund it, preferably with others doing the studies. If you get over 1% of your profits or your revenue on off-label uses, I think we should say, you got to chip in so we can study what's going on, uh, and um, and that we don't want surreptitious um, f marketing or marketing protected by the First Amendment. Uh, um, so one of the things that's happening is that uh, under the commercial free speech doctrine, uh, they can fund a study, a bad study, show some evidence of effectiveness, uh, distribute a million, two million copies of an article. And that's not off-label marketing, but it changes attitudes. So I would change what pharma does. I wouldn't change what physicians do in terms of their own clinical choices, but I'd at least study it. Yeah, regarding the issue of trust, of course, there are always like two sides of trust and distrust. And so far, I just think that there exists a lot or a large bulk of literature that already shows like the 
the effectiveness of trust, right? On a country level, for instance, if there's more trust that exists, there is typically like higher incomes and people are doing better in the countries. So I think, well, one cannot say that distrust is better on a general level. Like so far, I'm very much in the basic processes or investigating those basic mechanisms where I think it's fascinating to find that in some instances, like distrust outperforms trust, so to say, for a, like memories, like having concrete memories of instances. But one could already flip the coin at that stage, actually, to make the point that like having those differentiated memories of single instances might hinder you to get the big picture of everything, to integrate information into one big picture. So I'm really doing or having a difficult time to saying like what is better <laughs> the one than the other, even on the very like low level of just cognitive information processing. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, my name is Steve Kaiser, and I had a question on uh, cheating in Russia. Okay, uh, just this past week was a dedicated week in this country to uh, cheating education week, and it was consultants and everybody else trying to sell their product in order to stop cheating in American schools. Uh, the interesting part of this is at the end of the session, I immediately got an email from the. Uh, consultant saying, uh, wanting to discuss pricing with me, figuring I was an educator. Um, but here's the other twist. I heard a report that a um, the consulting firm wanted to negotiate with the local Boston area uh, school department to own the student tests that were submitted to them. Now, you see the racket? They end up owning it. They can sell the tests, which can then be tested by their software. <laughs> what I'd like to suggest is we have as much corruption in this country. It's just a little more subtle. Do you have a reaction? <clears throat> Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, many thanks for your comment. I would like to expand my studies and I would like to compare not I would like to compare Russian corruption probably with some other countries. 